So welcome everybody uh, to uh, the second part of the object storage. So uh, today we are going to introduce Amazon DynamoDB, which addresses uh, a different kind of use case than the one we saw yesterday, because we are storing smaller objects. Uh, to, for example, the shopping carts uh, that we have uh, in uh, uh, that, that Amazon is using. Uh, this is smaller than the uh, pictures or videos that you would store on S3, and it needs to be highly available in the sense that you you don't want to fail if you write if a customer clicks on order uh, to 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 add something to the cart you really want to push it uh, to the system and, and not have a, uh, an error, right? So this is why a different system was designed for the smaller objects and higher availability, and that's uh, Amazon Dynamo, right? So this is what we will look into today. So it's the same key venue model as uh, we saw yesterday with S3. It's simpler than a relational database systems. A relational database systems basically is too heavy for what we are doing here. There's too much functionality, it's too slow. So we oversimplify the system to just a key and a value. It's like a two column table uh, in relational systems. And all we, get, all we have is a get and a put, right? So we have nodes. It's going to, store, to be stored on plenty of nodes, cheap hardware, as we saw yesterday. And we want a few uh, constraints on that system for it to work. So the first constraint is incremental stability. We want to easily add new nodes to the system. So nodes can join or nodes can leave, right? Again, I'm saying node, it's a synonym for server, right? We typically say node in the context of a cluster. So nodes can join or nodes can leave and the system should continue to function, right? The second principle is symmetry. It's all cheap hardware, they're all the same. There is no uh, a node that would be like a supercomputer or, or, or have more control than the others. And that goes together with the decentralization of the system. Uh, so we don't have uh, some, some main node that, that, uh, that controls the others. It's going to be different from what we'll see next week uh, with uh, the Hadoop distributed file system, uh, HBase and uh, Spark and the other technologies. Today, we are fully decentralized. Right? Uh, and finally, uh, the system can be heterogeneous because in spite of being cheap hardware, it might not be exactly the same configuration on every machine, right? Some machines what, might have a bit less memory, some machines can have a bit more memory, right? What we do not require, however, is uh, resilience to attacks. Like the blockchain, for example, if you consider Bitcoin and so on, uh, it's also, also resilient to, uh, to, uh, to attacks, like it's called the, the Byzantine general's problem. Uh, here we are in full control. It's within the data center. We fully control the data center. So we consider that all the nodes are ours uh, and we, we trust them. So on the physical layer, what we are using is a peer-to-peer -peer network in the sense that every node can communicate with every other. So how does it work? We want to store objects and retrieve them uh, by key, right? So how do we treat it in such a way that it's very easy to do? So wh what we need is a hash table, right? It's an implementation of an associative array, but a distributed hash table. So there is a protocol that already existed before. And the idea is that you take the key that you that is associated with uh, with the value you you want to store, you hash it. So a hash uh, is is just a function uh, uh, that uh, produces a certain number of bits out of anything, right? And it has desirable properties, cryptographic properties such as avoiding collisions. It should it should roughly distribute well over the 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 like almost uniformly. Uh, ideally over the, the, the set of possible IDs, right? So in, in our case, we hash all the keys to 128 bits, right, in, in Dynamo. Of course, this is a parameter that in other systems might be different. What we do then is modulo two to the power of 128. It means that we start with zero, we go all the way up, 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 then only once, and then it starts over at zero. So it's a ring, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's really what you also saw in discrete math uh, with modulos and so on, right? Uh, uh, Z over NZ, for example. So we have this ring with all the possible values. So that's the maximal number of nodes. Of course, we are not going to have two to the power of 128 nodes in the system, right? But the total number of possible hashes is extremely high. So what we do next is that each server, each node that you have in your cluster generates a random uh, series of bits. In other words, it places itself randomly on that ring. Right, so this node will be here, this node will be here, and it's uniformly chosen, uniform at random, right? And so then what we say is that each node is going to store, to be responsible for storing all the key values 
when the key is before it on the ring. So the, this interval, for example, between this all the way to here is stored here. All the nodes right there, the, the key values that are um, here on this virtual ring are stored here and so on, right? So this is what I um, say here. So the domain of responsibility of this node here is all the keys that would be here in this ring. Again, it's virtual. It's purely mathematical, this ring. It's, it's in our minds, right, that we compute. And if it is in that interval between here and here, the, the hash of the key, then we store it there. All right, so this is how it works. So now what happens if we add and remove nodes? So let's imagine that this is the configuration. We have four nodes, and this node here is responsible for all the keys that would be located, the, the hash of which would be located right there on the ring, so all, the, all of this. We add this node right here. So what's going to happen? Well, this node should be responsible now for everything that is in there, right? All the keys for which the hash is here. And this node now would only be responsible for that part, right? So what happens is that all of that is handed over to that node, right? And then these keys are no longer uh, stored on, uh, sorry, these keys remain here, but these keys which used to be here are now here, all right? So this is what happens if we remove a node. So it needs, of course, some transfer, and that's fine. So the, the, the key values will be transferred over the network from this node to this node, all of those that were here. Okay, these nodes here are not affected. And this is great design because when you join or when you leave, it doesn't shuffle everything around, right? It only locally triggers a transfer of a few key values, just the ones that were here. When a node leaves, for example, this one, imagine that bam, it's gone. So this used to be responsible for this, and this node used to be responsible for this key values. If this leaves, we need to transfer uh, all of those that were here to transform them to that node. And now the node is responsible for everything right there. Of course, it's assuming that we have a chance to do it, right? That it wasn't just a crash of the computer and then it's irretrievable. We assume it's, it's smooth and, and seamless, right? So the computer, the, the, the server warned in advance, okay, I'm about to leave. Uh, please take my key values. Right. But what happens in the case of a crash, right? We still need to solve that problem because the node might have failed, suddenly crash, you know, and, 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 and then we lost these key values. And of course, that's very, very, very bad because we're talking about data of customers shopping, uh, you know, for example, the shopping carts. We don't want to lose anything. So what do we do? When instead of saying that a node is only responsible for this interval right there uh, between the preceding nodes and itself, we now say that it might be several intervals, n. So the big N is, uh, is what we are going to, going to call it. So in that case, two, let's say n equals two. What that means is that that node is responsible for the two intervals that precede it, right? This one is responsible for the two intervals that precede it, so this and this. What this means concretely is that all the key values that are in there in this interval are stored at two locations now. They are stored once here, right? and another time here, all right? So now what happens in this phase, then the key values are already there, right? So now it's replicated. I already told you about replication yesterday. That shouldn't be new. Replication is a way that we ensure durability. We, we prevent data loss. We, we diminish the risk of data loss in that way, all right? And this is with three. So in general, we call it N, right? Uppercase N, the number of ranges that a node is responsible for. So of course, now I have a very small number of machines, right? But, uh, but in general, there are going to be many more of these machines, maybe thousands of them all over the planet, if possible, even in multiple data centers in case of an earthquake, a natural catastrophe or a fire. Uh, so it's going to be an enormous number, right? Here, I'm really oversimplifying with such a small number uh, of nodes in there. All right? So. In older systems that DynamoDB, how did we know which key values were stored where? We used to have what was called the finger table, and that was using uh, an exponential search, an exponential search in powers of two. It's like you 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 basically hopped uh, maybe 32 there, then you do a binary search, and you 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 can uh, you, you can locate the location where. Uh, uh, where uh, a key value is stored, right? This was logarithmic in the number of nodes. But Dynamo doesn't do that. Instead, Dynamo has O of one. It directly goes where the key value is. And the way it does that is using preferences. 
every server, every node in our system knows where every interval is stored. It knows exactly just just realized the uh, computer wasn't plugged, so now I have battery, that's okay. So every node knows what intervals are stored on every other node. It's called the preferences. So this is duplicated and maintained across all nodes. There are distributed protocols for that. It's not the topic of this lecture, so I'm not telling you how, but there's lectures, for example, by Roger Vattenhofer on distributed systems that teach you how to do these things. There's Paxos, there's even blockchains now uh, that, that uh, also have uh, security features. But now we assume they just all have these synchronized preference lists. And for example, in that preference list, key A right there, that's, that's a key or an interval of keys by hash is stored on nodes one and two, for example. That's what, that's what is said here. And here we assume that we have two intervals for each node, right? N equals two. So we need at least N of them, and it's going to be sloppy, meaning that we always look for the, the first and healthy nodes, right? So if one is unhealthy, we go just further down the list, right? The first node in the list is called the coordinator. It's the first one you are going to speak with. Right? Uh, and then what happens is that you, you fetch whenever somebody wants to read, you go to all these N nodes, you wait for the answers, and you wait for at least R answers. R is a parameter that you configure. It's typically smaller than N. For example, you might have uh, N equals five and R equals two. So as soon as you receive two answers from two nodes, then that's it. You consider that you, you have what you need, right? So you wait for R. For writes, it's a different parameter. You wait when you write uh, some new key value, you wait for a confirmation by at least W nodes, right? And we have this, R and W must be chosen in a way they are typically smaller than N, but the sum of the two must exceed N. And of course, here there is a slider. You can have a small W and a big R, or you can have a small R and a big uh, uh, W, right? It's really up to what you want to do. If you have a small W, it means you don't wait for many confirmation. If you write, it's enough that one node confirms. But when you read, you're going to be extremely paranoid with a big R, right? Or you do the opposite. You're extremely paranoid when you write and you really wait for a lot of confirmations. But when you read, uh, you can trust that whoever answers first is going to have the right value, right? So the value you want. So it's up to you how you configure that, right? Okay, do we have a question? Not in the room and- oh. In the chat, I think in the Zoom chat. So the question is, so the trade-off is if we instead chose the position uh, of the node so that each domain of responsibility is equally sized, we would have, uh, we would have better load balancing, but adding slash removing nodes would be much more complex. Yes, so indeed, uh, le let me make that precise. The locations on the ring are chosen at random, uniformly at random. It means the intervals might not be exactly uh, perfectly the same. And if I correctly understand what you're saying, indeed, if we had exactly divided the ring into perfectly equal shares, uh, we could have done that. But then you lose that flexibility when you add and leave the nodes. Either you break that rule that it's equal shares, or you have to upload and download so much data across the networks that it's very inefficient, right? So this is why instead of perfectly equal intervals, we instead pick uh, at random. And if, when you have thousands of nodes, then, then the, that's typically going to be a pretty good balance, right? Does it answer your question? Awesome, perfect. We have another one. Uh, yeah. Is the preference list table centralized or are, or are all nodes synced? Uh, or are, I guess all the changes in the nodes synced? Maybe that's the question. Yep. So the Amazon paper doesn't give details about exactly how it is stored. So what I can do is guess or have a best guess. I don't think it's fully centralized because that's against the design of the system. So I don't think that there is one place where it is and everybody connects to it. Why? Because if it fades, everything fades. Instead, I think that this is a list that is synchronized across all of the nodes and it uses synchronization protocols that are from the distributed systems community, right? It's just not part of this lecture, but there exist protocols that allow you to synchronize 
uh, across uh, all of the nodes such data. It's like the, blo the blockchain for Bitcoin, right? The blockchain is actually entirely stored in every node of the network and they synchronize via the blockchain protocol, right? Okay, you're welcome. I think that answers it. Yeah, thank you. All right, so now having said that, what happens when somebody connects to the system, for example, the a service of Amazon responsible for the shopping carts, there's a load balancer, a random node is picked. This is one way of doing that. That random node has its preference list. So with the key that comes from the, from the request, it picks the coordinator. So that was this, right? The first in the list. It directs the request, directs the request to the coordinator and the coordinator will then ask all the N minus one or the other nodes that are supposed to contain the, uh, the, uh, the replicas of the key values and it asking, it's asking all of them, waiting for R or W, depending if it's a write or a read answers. And then it's going to ship it back to the client. I'm going to give more details about the protocol slightly later, right? And furthermore here, it's not just the first N nodes, it's the first L healthy nodes, right? If some of them are down or unhealthy, we just go further down the list. And we also try to, to make sure that it's uh, spread across data centers, right? So it's highly scalable, it's robust against failure because everything is replicated multiple times. It's self-organizing and nodes can join and leave without any centralization. As I said, we are assuming we are in full control and trust all the servers, right? It's within the data center, behind the firewall, we are in control and do not worry about uh, any node becoming corrupt, right? Uh, of course, there could be also data integrity problems. We can only do lookups. We cannot search within ranges, but this is something we'll see in the next few weeks. So all you can do is get put. Right? You can put a key value or get the value associated with a key. The first issue, and here I'm coming back to the question that you asked, what happens if we are out of luck, right? There's not enough nodes in the system. And we, we just by chance have an a, 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 a skewed distribution here and all of them are here. And now what happens is that this node right there has to store all the key values there. So this is the first issue that could happen if you have a small number of machines, right? A second issue is what if I, you have a very, very big computer right there that maybe has, I, I don't know, hundreds of gigabytes of memory. And this one has only eight gigabytes. Uh, then the, the, if it's evenly distributed, this computer will be idle because there's only this interval and this one might be overloaded with the same interval. So this is an issue of heterogeneous performance. So how do we solve that? We could artificially increase the number of nodes in order to, uh, to, uh, to solve the first issue. And we can bring some elasticity for the performance difference. Concretely, it's actually very easy. We virtualize the nodes. What it means is that we have virtual tokens that we put all over the ring, but maybe, I don't know, 10 times as many as the nodes. So we might have a thousand nodes, we'll have 10,000 tokens, right? So it's virtual nodes that are over there. And what happens now is that every physical node, every real node is responsible for like several tokens. So 10 tokens, five tokens, the bigger nodes will have more tokens and the smaller nodes will have less tokens. And whenever you're responsible for a token, what it means is that you're responsible for all the interval that precedes the token, more exactly the N intervals that precede the token, right? So this is the solution. We, we have an additional level of indirection. We have these virtual tokens that are virtual nodes responsible for intervals there. The bigger machines take over several of these tokens. The smaller machine take over less of these tokens. Now, if we delete a node, so this server uh, leaves the system, right? And these tokens are just reassigned to other machines. For example, this one is green, so it's assigned to this one. And this token is reassigned to that one. So you see, you can redistribute the tokens freely when nodes join or leave, all right? If you add a node, you just take over maybe this one, this one, and this token that are just reassigned to that node, all right? And you see that now we have so many more tokens that the odds that we get a skewed distribution on the ring is much smaller. So this reduces that risk. We also solve the heterogeneity problem because the bigger computers have more tokens and the smaller computers have less. All right. Now here's another problem that we need to solve because we said that we are very sloppy. It's called sloppy quorum. 
uh, it means that if you write to the system, uh, it might not fully propagate everywhere. Do you, do you remember the CAP theorem I told you about yesterday? If you want to be highly available and continue to function, if there is a network partition, you have to accept that you will be inconsistent and that part of the system will have a newer version of the value and some other part of the system will have an older version of the value. What it means, I don't know if this will make sense to you, but maybe you can think of it during the week. If you have a fully consistent system, the versions are linear, version one, version two, version three. It's like Newtonian physics, there is universal time. But in a system that would be uh, not necessarily consistent, but highly available, we go to special relativity, we go to space time, we might have space, space like separated versions, right? That's all I'm going to say about physics. I don't know how familiar you are. But what I'm saying is that it's no longer linear, time is no longer absolute. So how do we solve that? It was actually solved here at ETH by Professor Friedman Mattern, if I'm correct, uh, who is uh, in pervasive computing. This is called the vector clock and it's a special relativistic version uh, of, of clocks that allows conflict resolution uh, in systems that are eventually consistent. So how does it work? If we have a put to a certain node, we maintain the clock specific to a node right there. Uh, and uh, is there a question? Yes, there's uh, one chat? in the chat. So mm -hmm. does, does not the use of tokens go against the global stability, only local changes and cause bigger changes to the system? I think the question is, does the use of tokens not go against the global stability and cause bigger changes to the system? Uh, I think it's a good question. Um, I think the overhead is acceptable. It causes an overhead, but they tried it out there. You can read the, the, the Dynamo paper. They share a lot of experience. I think the overhead of that was found out to be acceptable and, and, and preserves the availability. But of course it wasn't obvious, right? Maybe it wouldn't have worked, uh, but it seems that it worked and that, uh, that it didn't cause these troubles, right? This is something you can only know if you try out. Sometimes you, 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 you cannot see it theoretically, but they tried and it seems to have, uh, to have done the trick. I'm not sure if this answers your question, maybe not theoretically. Yeah, all right. Okay. Okay. All right, so vector clocks. So now we put a value and it's node A that takes care of it. Uh, so it means the, it, it, uh, it's all version one. Then we put again for node A. Now imagine there's a network partition and now there's two parts of the system that are separate. In special relativity, it would like like very far away, very, very far away, uh, far, far, far away if you want. Uh, so now imagine that node B takes care of a put. So B will be associated with time one. And maybe here node C, which is disconnected from node B is going to have a concurrent, right? With a different value conflicting. And then it's going to increase its own time to one. And then we need to reconcile this when, we, when the, the, the network becomes available again and, and, and the partition is gone, we reconcile this. And the way it's done is you see by having three, which is bigger than two, one uh, larger or equal to one, greater or equal to one, and one larger or equal to one. What this is actually is a partial order. It's not a total order as you would have if you're fully consistent. It's a partial order. A partial order is basically reflexive, transitive and anti-symmetric, right? And it corresponds to what is called the directed asectic graph, DAG, DAG, right? We'll see them again in the lecture, these DAGs. But basically it means that all the versions of a, of a specific key value are not organized in a single line linearly, but they are organized in a DAG, right? And the link with uh, relativity is just that it's, it's called the causal, uh, a, a causal set, if you want. All right but it's really just an analogy. And this is the context I told you about that when, when I said it's a black box, this is actually what is in the context, it's the vector clock that keeps track of the version. And the goal, again, don't forget, the goal is to reconcile. This is what vector clocks are for, that eventually we reconcile the two values. All right, so let's give you an example. Duplication factor three, n equals three. Every node is responsible for three, uh, three uh, 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 intervals here. I'm forgetting about the tokens because it works the same way with the tokens. So this is just to simplify the graphics, but of course there, there would be the virtual tokens. So I have an incoming request. Somebody wants to put key one. It's always going to be key one to, to keep it simple for this example, value A associated with key one. 
what happens is that it's going to be stored on these three nodes right there. The preference list has N1, N2, N3 because of the interval in which it is. This is the coordinator. So the coordinator is creating that new context, okay? The, 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 the highest version so far for N1, this node right there is one. And then we store A associated with these vector clocks and we replicate to the other two nodes, right? Again, this is the vector clock, that's the context. And here it's all consistent. We have A, A, and A. So here it's fully consistent. Then if somebody gets the key, the client gets the key, it again talks to the coordinator right there via the preference list. All the versions are gathered, right? So in that case, for example, the three of them, it's all co consistent, A, A, A. So there's no problem there. And we just return that to the client. So here it's all good. Uh, it's consistent. There is nothing much to do. Uh, except just a return of that, all right? So again, this is the context. When the client wants to modify that value, it's just going to uh, put it back with the context that it received earlier, key one, the earlier context, the new value that is B, right? Let's, let's say it's B. So what happens is that now the coordinator updates the vector clock, now it's two for N1, and it stores this value right there and replicates. Right, so now we have this newer version. When you get the key, you gather all the versions. Now you have two versions, but there's no problem because this is fully ordered here. This is bigger than that, right? So in that case, we know question. the latest version is B. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do we return uh, the context R? The so do we return R, the con I guess the context R of the object or N? So the semantics of R is you wait until you have at least R answers. This is what it means. It doesn't mean you return exactly R values or you return exactly N values. So let me repeat for clarity what we are doing. We ask the values associated with the key and, and all versions from N nodes. That's what we ask. We will get answers from some of the nodes, but maybe not all. So maybe we will not get N answers, but we wait until we have at most at, at least R answers. Once we have R answers, it might be R plus one, R plus two, and that's okay. We just start processing the request with the answers that we got from these R nodes without waiting for the others, right? So this is, this is the idea, right? But it's not the number of answers we return. It's only the protocol for, that tells you how much do you wait, how, for how much time do you wait for the answers? This is why it's called sloppy. You, you don't wait until everybody answers. Okay. All right. All right. So now I received my at least R answers, and I have these two versions. And I notice that this version is greater than that one. So this is fine. I can discard A. It's not the latest version. B is newer, and I just return that. All right. So now the client says, OK, I'm happy. Now I want to write the third value, C, instead. So this is the new context uh, that the coordinator updates to three. But ta da da, there's action in there. It's not a Hollywood movie, but uh, you know, some things uh, happen. And we have a network partition right there that prevents communication with these other nodes. So we cannot replicate. This value right there uh, is, is, is just stuck there without any replication there. Okay. So now it might be that uh, this is the interim coordinator because maybe this is on another continent and the, the, the fiber optic cable in the ocean is broken or I don't know. And then somebody in, uh, in uh, Asia wants to access uh, this and this is going to be the interim coordinator. And if it wants to get the key, it will get B because C is on the other side of the Atlantic. It didn't propagate to us, right? So it's not consistent, but we do, we, we'll make do with it. So B is returned because in Asia, that's the newest version. And then uh, an incoming request might come to update the value. And then that interim coordinator would say, okay, I'm not M1, I'm, I'm, I'm N2, right? So in the vector clock, it's N21 that will be put there instead of increasing N1. And we store that new value there and replicate. Well, I, did, I don't think I did the slide for that, but we could replicate that value also there. Now, uh, the network partition is resolved. It's all connected again. We can sync again, and we can then uh, uh, propagate again the changes, right? Which I'll do in a few slides. But what happens then when we get a new value of key one? Well, we ask n nodes, wait for our answers, and this is what we received. So a and b we can discard, right? Because c is newer. 
But you see that for C and D, there is no order there. C and D are conflicting. They are conflicting. And as a consequence, you see it's a directed cyclic graph. That's what I told you. We, we have to solve that. The client has to solve that. It's pushed to the client. And then these are called maximum elements, maximal elements uh, of this partial order. We just return these two, and the client will deal with it. Okay. So we return these two uh, uh, values with the vector clock that, we, that is about to reconcile these two. And then the client might say, OK, in the meantime, we resynchronize everywhere. We clean that up. We can get rid of A and B because they are older than these two, right? And now the, cli the client made up its mind on how to solve that conflict between C and D. And it says, OK, my new value is now E, right? That is reconciling C and D. So I'm storing E. And now it's going to increase the vector clock now to 4 and 1 there and duplicate that value. The network partition is gone, right? So now everybody's connected again. And now you see this is reconciled, right? So the newest version now, there's only one left. It's E. C and D are now in the past. They are older. So I hope you see how this conflict resolution is happening in this system, right? So of course, that means you have a version history of the vector clocks. It's not linear as it would be in a consistent system. It's actually a directed cyclic graph. And you just create versions using these vector clocks organizing in a graph and you love it when you have an absolute maximum because there's no conflict but in the general case you might have several maximal elements that you need to resolve on the client do we have a question yes uh, do we eventually discard stored values in the nodes or do we keep them all uh, which means uh, requiring more storage as time goes on it's up to you uh, you it is basically something that you can decide when you build the system like that either you don't care about space and you can just keep everything or you can just be uh, have maybe lack storage space and then you just delete whatever is uh, superseded by a newer version. There might also be legal requirements. For example, you might not be allowed to keep the data for more than two years or, or maybe under GDPR or even data protection in Switzerland, you are required uh, to, to, to delete data after a certain time. So there's a lot of aspects right there. But what I'm saying is that it's orthogonal to the design of the system. You decide if you keep, if you delete, uh, if you have a certain retention interval that you, you keep everything for a year, for two years, uh, it's, uh, it's really up to you, right? So you could, for example, keep C and D, or you can also keep A and D, right? It's your choice, all right? Okay, so a few last words to finish with. In the Amazon mindset, as they explained in the paper, they have hundreds of services, maybe dozens. OK, maybe 100 now. It's probably in the hundreds. Amazon Dynamo, Amazon S3, uh, Amazon EC2, and so on. And you just combine these services with each other in order to build your service or your, your, your uh, website. Right? So it's really off the shelf. You have all these services that you can use and combine at will. In Azure, the mindset is a bit different. They tend to have larger services that do several things and that you can also combine. It's just a different architecture, right? So for example, Cosmos DB is an example of a database that does trees, tables, graphs. So it's everything uh, together integrated in a single system. Both are good. Both make sense. It's just two different choices of, of design of the system. Uh, uh, and of course, you, 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 it's, the ideas are similar, but you need to get used just to the mindset every time you pick a cloud provider. So what are the takeaway messages for us? We simplify the model. We threw away the relational database system. We just have a simple key value model, either for large objects with S3 or smaller objects, but uh, more uh, slow, uh, faster response times with Dynamo. Cheap hardware, plenty of cheap hardware is what we have in the data center. I hope it demystifies what there is in the data center. We also remove the schemas uh, when we make the metadata flexible. There's also no schema in the case of key values. The value is just a black box. But this is something we'll come back to in the next few weeks. All of these ideas you will see during the entire lecture right? on other, uh, other technologies. All right. So um, is there any questions left? In the room, on Zoom, on Mattermost? Mm, on Zoom, no. And in the room, I don't think so. Yeah, we have one question. Mm -hmm.
So the communication between these three nodes, uh, it seems sequential. Shouldn't they be uh, communicating with the, with the what, sorry? The coordinator. With the coordinator? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. These are also uh, uh, different designs and we'll see that also next week. Uh, it depends. You can have designs in which everybody con, uh, communicates with the coordinator, right? And, and in that case, because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, but you can also optimize that designs, uh, for example, next week we saw pipelining, that instead of everybody connecting to the coordinator, there is a pipeline of nodes that just cascade and propagates uh, the updates. It gives you more performance. It removes the bottleneck that you would have with the coordinator. Uh, uh, so I, 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 I'm not sure exactly which choice Amazon DB is, uh, is, uh, is doing, but you should be aware that there's these two ways of doing things, right? You can either have a centralized, uh, at least with the coordinator that talks to everybody, or some more uh, pipelined version uh, in order to remove the bottleneck on the coordinator. And both, both designs are possible. Okay, that seems to answer it. We also have uh, a few questions from the chat. So how does the partition network know how to assign new coordinators? So the coordinator is picked in the preference list. So remember that the preference lists are everywhere. So every node has the preference list. So what's going to happen in the case of a partition is that the coordinator is supposed to be N1, but you're in Asia, N1 is in, is in America, and it's unreachable because of this broken cable, let's say. So what happens is that since N1 is unreachable, you just keep it, go to N2, and this is why N2 is taken as the interim coordinator, right? So it's something that happens dynamically. As you discover that some nodes are unreachable, you just keep to the next one. Does it answer the question? I think it does. Um... Mm -hmm. We also have another question, but I think it's a bit uh, off topic. So would it be possible to upload the slides in PowerPoint format as well? Maybe this should be taken offline. I think they are uploaded. Uh, which slides are you, are you speaking about? Uh, I think he's referring to the lecture slides. Oh, they are already on Moodle. They, they were already uh, put there before the, before the lectures. You need to go to the course model that you can find, uh, I think through the uh, course web page, or you can also ask us, or we can provide it on Mattermost. Uh, you have access to the Moodle as soon as you're registered to the class. And in Moodle, you will have everything. You will have the, the uh, lecture slides, you have the YouTube recordings, you have the exercise sheets, uh, everything will be in there, right? If you have any issue accessing the Moodle, please let us know and we can help you. All right, I think there are no more questions. All right, so we are ahead of time. That's perfect. That gives some time to, uh, to uh, ventilate the room. Uh, oh, do we have a question on Zoom? I think I can see answer quickly. Uh, would you please explain the W nodes? Oh, W is a parameter. What it means is that when you write some new value, you wait for a confirmation before you tell the user that it's fine. So if you say W equals two, for example, then it means you send the right, the coordinator sends the new value to the N nodes, all of them, and it waits until two of them confirmed. You get one confirmation, two confirmations, then you can tell the user that's fine, and you let the rest happen asynchronously. It will maybe continue propagating, but you only wait for W confirmations that the write uh, is done. So the higher W, the more paranoid you are, and the lesser the value of W, the more sloppy, the sloppier uh, you are, right? Okay. That's good, Krista. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the exercise session. So on SQL, brush up your SQL. Make sure you know SQL. It will be useful later in the lecture. Uh, and uh, I will see you next week in CABG 61 or online at uh, 2.15. Thank you very much, everybody.